Hello and welcome to Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. I am your host, JP John Possibly Two Man Power Trip. Of course, joining me is the star of the show, the former WWE and ECW World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest minds and bookers ever in the history of business, Games Master, Taskmaster, Devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? Absolutely fine, John. Thank you. And yourself? Doing good. Can't complain. But, uh, I don't know the wrestling world, I guess, around the, the holidays, it, it slows down a little bit. But I know John Cena was on SmackDown, it kind of helped the, the ratings there. Dynamite is kind of you know, they haven't been able to get to a million. Have you, you know, in, in your come, I know you still do shows and conventions and stuff. Is wrestling still, you know, a hot button topic? Because a lot of the media, wrestling media, will say it is. But what do you think? Is wrestling still hot? Is still popular? Uh, I think that. The content is popular, but it's like we talked. I don't hear much people that uh, were casual fans ever talk wrestling anymore. Hmm. And I think it's be- I think the society has broken up everything into the, the departmentalized a lot of things. You know, you're only paying attention to football or you're only paying attention to wrestling or baseball. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the ratings are certainly good. Uh, all these uh, Vices shows and the Rock show and uh, the Tales of the Territory, I mean, there's certainly a lot of ancillary programs about wrestling besides wrestling itself yeah it's weird so it's so many other things and and wrestling gets covered in espn all the time and you know what i mean they always but it's weird it's it's mainstream but it's not it's popular but it's not it's a very weird kind of dynamic because when i was younger i mean everybody everywhere you're talking about wrestling all the time i mean the Hogan era, then then you got the Attitude era, then you got the NWO, obviously sprinkled in between. So people were talking about wrestling a lot more than I feel like they do nowadays. I think so too. And the other thing is, you you brought up a really valid point. Wrestling is boxed into an unknown area, like everybody knows it's prearranged, but. When you're going to do it, something, people say, oh, you can't do that. It's over the line. You know what I mean? Well, anything goes in a movie, right? Yep. So, I mean, it's funny how... Do they... It's still like the society's clinging on to kayfabe and somewhat in their own mind when people say, well, they can't get away with that. I mean, uh, I know it's cancel culture, but I'm not saying that kind of thing. I'm talking about a heavy angle or something. I mean, you know, it's a little bit strange to me that the, it, the box isn't designed yet completely for wrestling. Yes, because I feel like you can get away with stuff on TV that oh, if they didn't arrest. Oh man, they, they, we gotta you know we gotta cancel this guy or or whatever. But they do it in the movies all the time, and, and and they get away with it. It's weird the way the wrestling culture is. Very right. different. Right, right, and uh, with what we said, with people uh, getting less and less being all over a sports fan and departmentalizing their thoughts. What is too much to do? You know what I mean? Uh, it's 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 going to be interesting because I think it, when this all, the dust all settles, we're going to see some very interesting storylines. Do you think this is the hardest era to be a writer or a booker or, you know, on creative for storylines? Because, you know, you got to, you know, maybe play to the woke culture or you can't go over the edge or can't do certain things. Like, do you think it's the hardest time to be creative now? I think it's the hardest time for anybody right now. And not just wrestling, but look at the comics, the hits they've taken, right? Hmm. Comics have stopped playing on uh, campuses, 
correct? Yep. A lot of comics because what they perceive is funny. When you're the comics, you're going to offend somebody somewhere. You know what I mean? Times have certainly changed. Uh, I'll give you an example of things. Two of my favorite comics of all time. Uh, really pushed the envelope. George Collin and uh, Eddie Murphy. Do you think they could play today? Probably not, no. So what does that say about society? We're not going to let anybody speak out and maybe comedy style. It's crazy because I love Dave Chappelle and I love Bill Burr, two guys that like to go over the edge. They were both saying like maybe they don't tour as much or they do certain maybe just like a Netflix special or, or their podcast or whatever. But there are certain places they know like where millennials might be where they might not want to tour because they can't say stuff over the edge. They can't do certain material. They don't know what's you know what's too much. So, yeah, that stinks for comedians nowadays because they're always supposed to push the boundaries. And now they're not even able to without being canceled. Yeah. It's harder today to be creative. You're even saying it's harder today even to be a wrestler in, in, in today's business. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that some of the things that we've done are over the line, you know what I mean? And I don't want to bring up anybody's name, but there was a time where even McFoley was doing this bump, right? Come on, you didn't think it was going to be a backlash somewhere? Absolutely, yep. I think, but everybody, you know, it's like we're kind of a monkey see, monkey do world. If somebody gets away with something, somebody's going to push something a little bit more extreme. That was probably the most extreme thing I ever saw in my life. Hell in a cell, Foley. No, the bump that he took in Europe with the guy. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, with his with his ear falling off. No, 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 no. The guy that was kind of chased out of wrestling. He was an independent guy. I don't want to mention his name. Oh. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're not talking about WCW though, right? No, no. He was an independent guy. Went gotcha. to Europe. Jimmy Cornette hated his guts. Oh, yes. Okay. Mick Foley took the bump and Mick said, well, Jimmy, you saw the people smiling. Well, really? Do you know what I mean? Yep. So, I mean, when we start pushing things to the absurd, and wrestling is a circus of absurdity, but, I mean, you got to realize... that some things are very difficult to put back in the jar. And, I mean, maybe this is a... Maybe this generation is completely different because they went through their grandparents being hippies to their parents being gamers to... Maybe they're cultural background is so completely different than any time ever in history that their morals are completely different. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, definitely definitely possible. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, what a, what a weird time, for, for me anyway, like for a wrestling fan base, completely different than when I was a fan. I was like, man, the times have changed so dramatically it's almost crazy how much it's like what what you read on twitter to what what you know what you see on tv it's it's crazy like certain things you're like that wasn't that great but twitter loved it and you'll think yourself like wow what a different fan base right 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 and look at this probably 
if he is in the greatest comic of all times, he's right up to the Mount Rushmore. Uh, Red Fox. Oh, yeah. He, he could never do what he did today, could he? No, not a chance. No. So, I mean, I have has a thought process action changed and i i get a this is like I, you know i hate conspiracy theories but i've been watching and this is scientific fact that our brain has sort of changed because the iphone have you read anything of that really no mm -hmm. yeah the stimulus is the same thing as when the ping goes off we get an alert and it's almost like pablo's dog with a you know, rang the bell and you start surviving, right? Yep, yep. And I wonder if that has something to do with it. Ah, interesting. Our psychologies have changed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, completely. So as far as the topic at hand, what I wanted to talk to you about today was none other than Brett the Hitman Hart and his time in a WCW. Obviously, this all gets spurned about, and obviously the great documentary about it, Wrestling with Shadows, and, and that goes kind of more into detail of the WWF side of things. Obviously, on this show, I want to focus more on the WCW side. But just to put into some context, obviously, Vince signs him to some $20 million deal. Then he basically tells him he can't afford it. It's too much. WCW is killing them. You guys are killing WWF. He's not going to be able to afford to pay bread. You know, he doesn't know what's going to happen with WWF. And all of a sudden, the Montreal Screwjob happens on November 9th, 1997. WWF Survivor Series, Montreal, Canada. Shawn Michaels becomes champion. Bret Hart walks out the door and infamously, you know, pantomimes the, the WCW. What did you think of the Montreal Screwjob? Obviously, you know, a, a lot of people have different opinions. Some people even say part work. I mean, I'm thinking 100% shoot, but what do you think about the Montreal Screwjob and how you guys were able to get Brett off the back of the Montreal Screwjob? I mean, I've heard many, many theories like you have. I've heard 100% shoot. I've heard work. I've heard a mixture of both. But And this isn't, let's just throw a bunch of facts out there and let's not make it an assumption whether it was or not. The camera crew was there that night. Yep, from Russell the Shadows, they're there. Yep, documentarians, yep. And they got back at, into the dressing room after the screw job. Apparently, yep. I mean, they have film of it, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there wasn't apparently they did get back. Yes. Yeah. Then yeah. uh, staggers down the hall. It was also who got a huge boost from that. We thought we were going to, right? Yep. That was the start of Mr. McMahon. Yes. Brett screwed Brett, if you infamously, or he infamously yeah. said on yeah. Raw to, to Jim Ross. Yep. The next night, right? Brett screwed yep. Brett. <sighs> the time honored tradition, as Vince said. Yeah. Were we that dumb that we couldn't figure out what to do with press? Hey, that that's what I was going to ask you about getting into it. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Some, you know, and I'm not, I'm taking like the rest, most of the rest of the world believes. Yeah, I'm taking on face value. It happened. But boy. What should have been a huge home run for us became actually what saved them. Yep. The emergence of Steve Austin and the emergence of Mr. McMahon. Yep. Who was the, who were the best 
team of all times. Great baby face, great heel. Yeah. I don't think enough emphasis is put on it today that Vince was the greatest heel of all times. Maybe. Wow, high praise. Well, he saved his company. But he had the perfect dance partner. Yep. You know, perfect angle too. Yep. Yeah, take this job and shove it. You know, Johnny Paycheck. Uh, but when it got over to our side, there was some kind of disconnect. And I wasn't really, really involved this time by that time. Uh, Maybe there was something on Hogan's end that he wasn't excited about Brett coming. I'm not sure, but Brett ended up financially doing very, very well, right? Yes. So everybody, Brett turned out okay, but man, if we look at way, it's like a trade, right? You know, uh, Who's the guy the Red Sox got from for Big Poppy when they got him from Minnesota? I forget his name. He never pitched an inning in the major leagues after the trade. Uh, some trades just turn out better. I mean, could how well do you think they handled the Brett situation, WCW? He should have been coming off that screw job over and hotter than any baby face ever that made a jump, I think. I think so, too. You could say arguably the hottest free agent ever because there was so much juice. I know Debbie said he was kicking WWF's ass, but there was so much juice behind the Montreal screw job. Like, holy shit, the boss really screwed one of his wrestlers. Like right. there was so much talk about that was the one of the hottest things in wrestling. I mean, that really that really catapulted them. But you just said something. Was were they talking about Brett jumping over WCW, or were they talking about what you said? The boss fired and screwed one of his wrestlers. A lot Which, of it was predicated on Vince, I think, maybe even more so. That's what I'm asking. I think about the, or I'm alluding to a trade. Sometimes trades work out for both teams. Do you think that, could we go all this far, JP, and saying the screw job might have saved WWE? Definitely could argue it for sure. Because it helped catapult. I mean, then all this obviously Austin caught fire. Then they bring in Mike Tyson and kind of, you know, the, the rest is history. But you could put it right up there and say, without that spark, who knows what happens? Right, right. So, I mean, and I hate to think, I've heard guys say on podcasts, oh, they didn't know what they're going to do till the last minute bullshit do you believe vince mcmahon went in that building not know what he was gonna do of course yep him and only maybe a handful of others knew yep yeah and i think the handful could put on a few fingers right yep because pat patterson didn't even know jr didn't even know uh pat said he didn't know yeah, I think maybe because he was so close to Brett, maybe they uh, Vince might have thought he might say something to him or might might do something differently. Okay. It looked like Bruce knew, obviously, Michaels, Triple H, and Jerry Briscoe knew. And then eventually, obviously, Earl Hebner. Obviously, yeah. So it was pretty crazy that that catapulted them and – we didn't know what to do with Brett. That is the remarkable thing because 
it's kind of teased that, you know, he's coming in. Bischoff mentions that, oh, Brett's coming in. He's going to be a part of the NWO. He's just, you know, obviously because Bischoff is part of the NWO. He's saying that and popping up. It's like, oh, we got the hottest free agent. But it's one of the things where you guys are building up to Star K97, your biggest pay-per-view ever. It's going to get 700,000 buys. So you already have, I mean, when, when he actually shows up to Nitro and makes his official WWE debut, it's December 15th. So, I mean, that's only two weeks later you guys have Starcade. And there's been a year build between Hogan and Sting. So was it a bad time to for him to almost become a free agent? Or is that crazy to think? Because it's almost like you guys had the, your biggest show ever on paper already planned out. You had this main event planned out for a year. Was, was it almost bad to bring in Brett? But you had to bring him in because he was so hot at that point. I think if you go back to that finish, the Sting Hogan match, mm-hmm. wouldn't it have been better that if Stinger got Hogan into the Stinger move, right? If Brett came down and stomped on Hogan and the referee had to disqualify, and I hate to think like this, this and it's just off the top of my head because you have 700,000 buys and the, this is not the most appealing thing is a DQ but he stomps on Hogan gets Sting disqualified, Sting goes crazy he grabs the mic, Brett, and says sorry Sting I, I can't let you beat him he owes me Going back to when didn't Brett say that Hogan, that Vince told him he was going to do the job for him? Yep. The rumor is that they actually took a picture together and were playing tug of war with the WWF title, which was supposed to be SummerSlam 93. That's That's been the longstanding rumor. Brett says it. Um, people in WWF have said it, but then they were saying that the, the picture is gone. They, there's no evidence of it, but th- several witnesses, I think maybe even Bruce Pritchard mentioned as well, that they did a tug of war. It was going to be the pay-per-view of the poster cover of SummerSlam 93, and Brent was going to go over, and Hogan said no. So why did Hogan say no about putting Brent over? Do you know? Yeah, he's too small. He he didn't want to do it. That's not the guy. So he got the hand pick basically Yokozuna saying this guy's a monster. He I you know, I'll lose to him. This this will be believable. For whatever reason, he just didn't think Brett was the guy. And uh, I was listening to an old interview with Hulk. He always referred to him as, oh, the, the tag team guy. And I think me and you have talked about this before. They used to do handicap matches. It'd be Hogan, you know, and a partner a few times. I think it was actually Hogan and Savage against eight, uh, Honky Tonk and the Hart Foundation. So he's like, oh, we used to do uh, handicap matches against the Hart Foundation, stuff like that. So that that's what he had in his mind, that, who Brett was. And it also was Hogan against Brett and Jim the Anvil Nighthawk in a handicap. Right. So was that what Hogan perceived? That's a, that apparently he couldn't get that out of his head that this guy had become a huge star. I guess the wrestling with shadows didn't phase Hogan. I don't know for whatever. I mean, that would be later on but talking about the WWE run, but the WWF run for some reason that never got out of his head as far as him being, you know, a tag guy, I guess. Yeah. Even though he was well past it. Yeah. Yeah. And in 93, I mean, Hogan on his way out still had a lot of clout, obviously still held a lot of political power because he ends up winning the title at WrestleMania nine. So, I mean, obviously he, I mean, whatever he said, Vince still kind of held on to it. And, and you know, that finish I just laid out, that thing gets disqualified and Brett says, Hey, sorry to do it to you, but I got to beat him first. You, you just set up a three-way program right there. Sting against Hogan. I mean, yeah, Sting against Hogan, Brett against Hogan, Sting against Brett, Brett against Sting. You know, I mean, there was great, great uh, latitude there. I don't know if that finish off the top of my head is the one you go with, but boy, uh, what not that a famous slow count, too, or fast count? 
Yeah, we've talked about this before. Back in the archive, yeah. talking about uh, Sarkia in 97. I've actually interviewed Nick Patrick on my uh, two-man power trip. And if you go back in the archives, listen to that. That is the infamous thing. And actually, Bischoff, Nick Patrick, and Conrad were just sitting all down together talking about it. Basically, um, Bischoff wanted a certain count. Hogan wanted a certain count. And Nick Patrick was told by Sting that Sting was told it was supposed to be a fast count. So what is your kind of memories of how it was supposed to go? I wasn't involved in that, but this is the, I mean, maybe I was involved. Three guys sat down and gave the referee a count. So basically Nick Patrick was going over the match separately with, um, with everybody. And apparently the, Sting was told that the finish was supposed to be a certain way. Then he spoke to uh, Hogan, and Hogan said, "Ah, slow it down. And then he finally went to Bischoff, and Bischoff said to him, well, kind of just do a regular count. Like, not not a fast count. Like, he almost, like, counts out to Hogan, and basically was like, yeah, kind of make it a regular count. Don't make it fast. Don't make it slow. Okay. That's interesting. Right? Weird. I mean, I never have been into... I'm sure I have been. Well, that's the time I've been in it. But I don't remember ever going over finishes where you said the referee, you know, fast count or uh, three different counts came up. I don't know. To me, and this is like the weirdest thing ever, Bischoff was saying... Sting was out of it, meaning drugs, obviously something drug related or, or whatever. I know he had just had elbow surgery. Uh, Sting even said he wasn't in a great frame of mind just because his personal life with his wife, I guess, you know, he, he had been cheating on his wife and they were trying to work it out. He's trying to become born again. He was trying to get off drugs and alcohol. I mean, a lot of things are going on in Sting's mind. I think, you know, if you remember Shivani, look at the arms there, Sting. He still looked good. Bischoff also complained that he wasn't tan enough, which is kind of strange. It just seemed like a little bit of a power play. Like Hogan basically said, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this guy. He seems a little out of it, brother. A year away from the ring, we've been building this up for a year. And, he, you know, he's not at peak shape, peak condition. My only problem with that is Sting is on every show after that. He main events Nitro the next night against Hogan. He eventually <laughs> wins the belt versus Hogan. So he obviously was with it enough to be there every single show. You know what I mean? Like, so... Obviously, it's it seems like a, a Hogan power play, and it seems like Bischoff cowtowing to Hogan. Well, I'm not sure if Eric cowtowed to Hogan, but Hogan didn't get to where he was without being able to manipulate finishes, right? And explaining them. I mean, a lot of people think they know. Oh, why did that happen? It's very, when guys are going over finishes and there's more than two guys and there's an agent and maybe the booker and all this, when you're going over them, it gets to be convoluted. And what did you say? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we can, well, no, no. The guy that speaks the cleanest and clearest, it usually turns to him. Yep. Because so, Hogan always knew what he wanted. So, yeah, I could see him. What you said about you said about Brett that he could never get over him being a tag team guy, and Brett doing jobs for him. Maybe that stuck in his craw. For sure, the thing with Sting is obviously Hogan has got to realize that that's going to kill the whole momentum of the character and the feud and the one year arc though, to do the count. And then, you know, to, so he would have an out so they could have a rematch, you know, Sting wins the title, but he had an out to get the rematch and stuff. I don't know. Hogan's got a, I don't know who the hell knows what he's thinking about and going through his mind there, but Hogan and Bischoff got to be smarter than that. My whole thing was that people were complaining. Sting never kicks out. I've watched the tape a million times, even that night, me and a buddy of mine, and a bunch of the friends who watched the show, we taped it on VCR, we're watching it. Sting does kick out, and, and you could see his right shoulder just kind of come up. Instead of saying fast count, and I know you know it might have been too quick, but the next night in Nitro, you guys could have changed it. Should have just said Sting kicked out. That was my whole thing. Like, 
that would have been the saving grace for Sting because the shoulder went up. I don't know. Is there a reason why they never went in that direction or they didn't even think about that? I'm sure. I mean, isn't that how Hogan won? So basically, he does a leg drop. Nick Patrick does a regular count, and, and he thinks he wins. But Bret Hart comes out and says that, hey, that was a fast count, not not happening. He beats up Nick Patrick. The match is restarted. Sting puts him in the scorpion. He taps out. Bret Hart calls for the bell because Bret's a referee because for whatever God, God knows what reason, and we'll get to this in a second, he was the referee of Zabisco and Eric Bischoff the match earlier. So technically, he's a referee. He calls for the bell. And... Um, Sting wins the title. He has a rematch the next night on Nitro to kind of further fix the title situation. That doesn't fix the situation. If we go to the Thunder, that sets up a match for Super Bowl, which Sting ends up winning. But, man, what a crazy finish. Yeah, it wasn't uh, the cleanest way to get there either. You're right. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think we'll ever know. Weird. Yeah. yeah. So you're booking it, right? You kind of have nothing. This is not you, though. This is Hogan and Bischoff. This is okay, Kevin. We're, we got this. They they have taken that over then. When Ho when uh, Eric and Hope Hulk kind of when Brett came in, he was the guy that they gravitated to, along with Kevin Nash. They were booking that. So Brett was getting a, around $1 million for WWF. He comes to WWF. He's getting $2.5 million a year. He's getting Hogan money. Maybe not as much as Hulk, but he's getting Hogan money here. So you, you bring him in, and I know he's got the 60-day no-compete, so he could be on the show, but he can't wrestle until January. Do you think making him a, a referee, not only for that, that convoluted schmoz finish, but for Zabisco versus Eric Bischoff? Do you think that's the best way to use the hottest free agent in the business? That just seems horrible to me. Just I don't know, just it was weird. It was like, wow, Brett's the referee. Again, not knowing when they signed him that kind of money, I'm sure the North Tower said, uh, he's on this pay-per-view, right? What's he gonna do? Well, he can't wrestle. What do you mean he can't wrestle? Yeah, I got another one compete. But he's on this pay per view, and then they would do seven hundred thousand pay per view buys. They're congratulating themselves, the North Tower. Well, see, we told them to put them on, so they come out looking good. So maybe Eric's appeasing them at this moment. Yeah, because you need a special referee for Eric and Sabisco, I don't think. No, that was for control of WCW, Nitro, and, and Tabisco ends up winning it. But uh, I don't know. To me, it's like, wow, you got Bret Hart. He's coming off Montreal Screwjob. Really? He's got to be a referee in that? Uh, like, isn't, isn't there something better that you could have used him for on that pay-per-view? I think they could have, yeah. Or not even add him on, do vignettes. Coming to Nitro, well, you know, January, yeah. whatever, I guess. Yeah, uh have him appear on something, come up with something creative that he wasn't going to wrestle. Yeah. I think about the ratings. I know December 15th, 97th, that's a, that's a good rating on Nitro. And obviously he may have not maybe necessarily him because you guys were on a roll, but maybe popped the, the rating just a, a little bit at that point. But to me, it really did feel a, a bit wasted that he's involved with Zabisco and Bischoff. And then part of a horrible sting Hogan schmoz, just like, so hot to almost like cool them off right away. That's what it felt like to me. Well, you know, you were a customer at the time. Hmm. So, you know, what do they say? The customer's never wrong. So maybe you saw something. It was really a strange, strange turn of events. When you got him, did you think like, wow, this is going to, you know, now WBF is done. We're going to kill him now. I mean, we just got their biggest guy. I knew Brett was very valuable. 
and I knew he would make an impact. But I had a feeling in my head, this is a very smart guy. And all of a sudden, the missing man comes the next week, next day, right? Yep. Brother, you could almost smell it. You know what I mean? That in the way he portrayed himself, like you said, he didn't do the time on a tradition. Like he's trying to be the keeper, the gatekeeper. Yeah, he's the moral the, compass of wrestling. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, was, it, was like, it was crazy. And, uh, so, knowing Vince McMahon, I think Nash and I had a talk and said, boy, this guy is hot. He's like uh, Cher. When the world is at its end, it'll just be Cher McMahon and the cockroaches left, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it's funny. Brett comes on the other side, probably bitter, probably pissed off. You know, he spent, God, uh, 13 years in, in the WWF. His boss screwed him, a guy he was very close with. He end, comes to WCW, gets double the money. You know, if you really look at it, triple the money it, in, in the long run of what he would have made in the WWF. It's just crazy. Well, you know, the amount of money he was getting. So it's like, okay, what do you got for me creatively? His first feud in January when he's able to wrestle is against Ric Flair. And it's actually set up pretty good on Nitro because it's like, you think you're the best wrestler? I'm the best wrestler. I'm the man. So there was some good kind of back and forth between Brett and, and Flair. And when they have their match that sold out, which is Brett's first match in WCW, great match. I actually think it was better than their WWF encounters, which were about uh, five or six years earlier. Great match that sold out. But not the main event. Savage versus Luger is the main event, and not involving Sting and Hogan interfering and stuff. But very interesting. Bread is not the main event. In is there a reason for that? My thought is that somehow from the beginning, Brett was in a tough situation, and it got tougher as time we went going on. How would you bring Flair and Brett not knocking Sting and Luger, they're homegrown, but you just paid all that money f f for Brett. He just was the hottest free agent. And you got him on the semifinals? Yep. Kind of hard to figure that one out too. It was almost like somebody manipulated that was a brilliant manipulator that was so smart, not many, very few people could see through it. But little things like that, because when you're in it, in the trenches, sometimes you don't see the forest from the trees. But when you're not in it and step back, you say, like you just said, what was he doing in the summer main event? There were so many guys before Brett gets there that are top guys. Hogan, Savage, Sting, Luger, the Giant. Um, you know, Goldberg is about to come up, you know, come on the rise. DP is on the rise. I mean, you guys were just loaded with star power and main event guys. Is that just almost too much? Is it possible that too many main eventers as Bret Hart entered WCW? I mean, <laughs> JP, that's like having the 1927 Yankee lineup, right? Right. I mean, why would, I mean, let's see, your talent is what makes shit work, right? Talent is the deciding factor. So why not bring Brett over? He fit in perfectly. I thought he should have been independent of the NWO. But the way that was handled too was not clean, right? Because I remember specifically one time, do you remember 
Everybody had NWO shirts on. He had some other kind of T-shirt on. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, so it's like he's not fitting in somehow. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, you know, he's standing out like a sore thumb. It's funny, too, because years later when Hogan Hall Nash go back to WWF, it was almost the same exact thing where obviously, you know, they got put in decent spots and Hogan, of course, got put in a great spot. But it was one of the things where Austin, Undertaker, The Rock, they all complained that, hey, we beat these guys. Why are they getting this big push? And I guarantee you, Hogan, Hall and Nash that said the same thing about Brett. Hey, we were kicking this guy's ass. Why would we give him the big push? Where are the number one guys? I feel like that was a big resistance point, too. And I think Bischoff kind of agreed with Hogan. Like, hey, we, that's right. We were kicking your ass. What do we need you for? Instead of saying, this is the hottest free agent in the game, let's give him a huge push. Yeah, that probably, I mean, who knows what was going on? This was uh, this was probably the, one of the most strangest things I ever saw, where a guy with all the steam and all the sympathy from the wrestling fans was on him, yet the guy that did it to him became the biggest attract, bigger attraction. Yeah, so strange, so weird. Yeah, yeah. almost don't know how, the, how that could could happen, but it's exactly what happened. And with him, as he kind of goes along, he's beaten Brian Adams on, on Nitro. He's beaten Kurt Hennig on Uncensored. It's not like main. It's not main event. I mean, it's not. He's got kind of an associate of the NWO. He's kind of a member of the NWO. So it's like, wow, so we're just kind of throwing him. He's he's not a, you know, he's not really a main event. He's not really a top guy. He's helping Hogan beat Savage for the title. It's it's like he's like an ancillary piece. He's just there. It's it's a very strange way to book the hitman. Yeah, and the, uh, going back, even the little things like the T-shirts, you know what I mean? Uh, it just was like, whether he may have been doing some of it on his own too with the t-shirt thing. It was like, I don't know. It was not well received. That's for sure. His first title match. This is crazy to think his first championship match at WCW is in basically July Bash of the beach. It's, it's all these months later and he's wrestling Booker T for the TV title. And he loses by DQ. It's like, Holy shit. Like, what, I mean, I love Booker, but the TV title, like, what are we doing here with Brett? I mean, that's, it's just, it stinks for Brett. Then, you know, and then he starts shooting with DDP over the U.S. title and he wins the U.S. championship. Then he loses it to Luger and then he, then he beats Luger for it. So it's like, I don't know, it's like we're really making him a mid card TV title for his first pay-per-view uh, championship match. And um, the U.S. title, he's not going after the world title. What do you think? Like uh, poor use of, of the hitman here. He's like a upper mid card guy, oddly. Didn't he question Hogan about when the thing with Yokozuna and he wouldn't put Brett over? Didn't he? he said Vince told me you said you would. Yeah. Yep. And then they walk in and Vince say. Brett, that's what you thought I said? Yes. Yes. The infamous, like, which a lot of the guys always say, that's what you thought. That's what you perceived it, as I said. Yes. Yes. Obviously, he talked to Hulk after Hulk said no. And it's like, okay, Hulk. <laughs> and uh, Hulk. Cowtown and Hulk. Hulk might have never forgot that either. Yeah. Because it seems like. If you think about it, it's like, okay, Bischoff, obviously, Hogan guy, Hogan's a Bischoff guy, whatever, just seems like they were in, in in line, step in step with, all right, let's not really give him a big push. You, on the other hand, like, where, where did you stand? Did you, you're just, okay, you know, just going along with it, almost? I, I had no say in it. They were actually the ones with Brett, too. I mean, Brett was involved in this. It wasn't that he was not. Yeah, they were saying he had creative control input. Not creative control, but he had input to create it. Yeah, I mean, it was not that he was not, uh, he could not control his own destiny, but he certainly could direct it. So, I don't know. 
So basically, he's going to say he in, in September, leading up to Halloween Havoc, that he's after this fall brawl war games match. We've talked about this before in the archives, fall brawl '98, where it's like Team Hogan versus Team WCW versus Team Wolfpack, and Bret Hart's on Team Hogan. DDP gets the win, pinning Stevie Ray, which sets up DDP versus Goldberg for Havoc, setting up Havoc for Bret Hart. Though he's going to be in a U.S. title feud with Sting. Basically, he'd say, oh, I'm, I'm turning babyface, forgiveness, I hate Hogan. And there's a match on September 28th, Nitro, between Hogan and Brett. Like, holy shit, we're getting this big Hogan-Brett match. We're finally getting it, and it's a schmoz. Brett ends up, Sting ends up coming out. Brett turns on Sting. Or, well, first of all, Brett fakes an injury. They kind of card him out. Then he comes back out, nails the replacement, which is Sting. So it's one of those things where we're bait and switch. Oh, wow, we're going to get Brett versus Hogan. This is a huge match for Nitro. Nope, he fakes an injury. He comes out, he beats up Sting, sets up a Sting Bret Hart feud. Again, it's like, wow, we almost got Hogan, Bret Hart, and it was just a bait and switch for Bret Hart to turn heel again and help Hogan. Yeah, and we didn't get it. So, again, very strange. Strange brew. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was not. It's so hard beat Sting at Havoc. Then he loses the DDP, loses the uh, the U.S. title. But it's you know, to me, it's just nuts. It's like they've got nothing going on with uh, Bret Hart. It's just uh, t- to me, it's like uh, mind boggling. It's baffling. But you have all these other guys kind of in line ahead of him. You know what I mean? Like wa- even Warrior comes in and steps in line ahead of him. Yeah, Sting's ahead of him. Luger's ahead of him. H- Hogan, Savage, the Giant. Like it just seemed like that you guys had were stacked up top. Paul Nash. And he wasn't able to to break into the to the main event scene, even though he's former five time WWF champion Bret Hart. Right, strange. So, Nitro. so there's a, a big um, Nitro in in '99, March 29th edition, Toronto's Air Canada Center, which is huge, and obviously he's a part of the sellout crowd. They're the ruckus crowd. Basically, they do a thing where where he challenges. Uh, Goldberg, he's got a jersey, hockey jersey on. He challenges yeah. Goldberg. Kind of comes out of nowhere. It's kind of he's just kind of floundering. He even said he kind of had like nothing going on. There's nothing to do. So let's just do this angle where where Goldberg's going to come out. We're going to start a few with Goldberg. The only thing was really he needed time off because he had a groin injury. Dean Malenko in his match somehow, some way they got a little screwed up there, and Dean Malenko ended up hurting Brett's groin in the match. Brett would need to sit out for surgery. But Goldberg comes out after Brett badmouths him, spears him. He's knocked out. He takes off the hockey jersey. He's wearing a steel plate. Right. What did you kind of just think of that angle? Because it's not going to go anywhere. And then all of a sudden he goes, hey, Bischoff, I quit. Do you like that, though? Because he he this is a big angle sitting up against Goldberg, but he's injured. So why? what, what, what purpose does that serve? I have no idea. I didn't like it when I heard it. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you were going to, I don't know. It seems that there was ill winds behind Brett's back. Maybe when uh, he said, hey, you're supposed to do a job for me way back when. And the uh, shepherd took him into the woodshed. And the shepherd's dad said, no, that ain't going to happen. That always stuck with the shepherd. I don't know. Ooh, so then, obviously, the death of Owen, his brother, Owen Hart, he passes away tragically at the at the Over the Edge WWF pay-per-view. Brett ends up taking, after he's, he's injured too, but he ends up taking months off, really, to kind of just be with his family and you know, obviously grieve over the loss of his brother. He doesn't end up returning until September 13th, 1999. Bischoff is gone. You know, he just left, so yeah, Russo's not quite in yet, but, you know, we kind of got a few weeks of the uh, Terry Taylor booking era, if you will. Um, but he comes back. It's him and Hogan versus Sting and Luger, kind of establishing himself as a babyface, aligning with Hulk Hogan against who's going to be two heels, Sting and Luger. So he's back in, in 99 and kind of in the main event, but again paired with Hogan. It's one of the things that always comes off as Hogan's 1A, he's 1B, or Hogan's 1, he's 2. Right, right. Then they have a great, great Owen Hart tribute match. Harley Race is there. It's on the October 4th Nitro. Bret Hart defeats Chris Benoit from the Kemper Arena in Kansas City, Missouri. Obviously, that's where Owen had died that, that previous May. 
Um, Got to be a, obviously a weird, eerie feeling for Brett, but an awesome match with uh, Chris Benoit that night. Can't you know? Can't kind of write a better opponent or give him a better opponent just to go out there and have a great wrestling match than Benoit. No, absolutely not. But doing that building to me, that must have been very hard on Brett. Yep, definitely. Yeah. And just and then just after that, it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, where do we go from here? Russo is in now. So where do we go from here? He had said he was a big Bret Hart fan. Obviously, he wrote a lot of the stuff for Bret Hart, uh, you know, during during the end of Bret's run there. But basically, he was saying he kind of wanted to reestablish Bret as a top guy. So what uh, Russo does, he has a 32 man tournament. We've talked about this before. Odd number, but what you know. You know, obviously it's an even number, but just a strange thing. You hear eight man tournaments, sixteen man tournaments, sixty four man tournaments. This one is the thirty two man tournament. Bret Hart wins the tournament. He beat Perry Saturn, Kidman, Sting, and then Benoit in the finals at Mayhem. We've talked about that before. But Bret Hart finally, with Russo, is the WCW champion. Do you like that he's finally the champion? I think it's time that's passed it by. He's been, he was, you know, it's been well, well, well over a year. <laughs> and yeah. he finally gets a sniff of the title and, and he wins. I think time had just passed it by. What do you it's, think? To me, it came off as like finally he won it, but it was like, man, this is cold now. He was yeah. hot. He completely cooled off. He was injured and his brother died. So he was off for months. It just completely cooled him down. And it was like, man, they didn't strike the iron while it's hot. I know Russo's a new booker there, but they didn't strike the iron while it was hot. I think you're right. Then, of course, you know, he's got a, a few matches with Goldberg. He has the Starcade 99 match, which he wins, thanks to a little bit of chicanery with Roddy Piper and the powers that be. But Goldberg ends up kicking him in the head. Really, though, he fell on the floor doing a figure four and hit the back of his head. Still wrestled about 10 matches after this, but suffered from post-concussion syndrome, which basically ended his career. Do you blame Goldberg at all? Did you ever go back and watch that, and do you blame Goldberg at all for that? Well, you just shocked me. I thought he never had a match after the kick. No, he had 10 more. It was either 9 or 10 more matches in WCW, including hardcore matches and, and a match, I believe, with Nash where he took a powerbomb. So he had about 10 more matches after that. So... Even he says it about Goldberg, and he's very bitter about it with Goldberg, but not necessarily 100% accurate because he still wrestled after that. Okay. For, probably he's frustrated. I'm not sure. You know, He even wrestled Goldberg the next night because they took away the title because he said it was controversy. They form NWO 2000 with, uh, with Scott Hall and Jeff Jarrett and Brett, and he, he beats Goldberg again the next night on Nitro. So he even wrestled the next night. Wow. Well, whatever happened ended a very good career. But he landed on his head by putting the figure four on the on pole. the floor. Yep, yep. That I always thought good. that was like the beginning of it. He does get his hand up for Goldberg. You know what I mean? He always says he didn't. Yeah, he I saw his, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing was not what they expected. It probably wasn't what Bray expected either. No, it was very much the opposite. Like, oh, we got the hottest free agent in the game. We're going to kill WWF. And the opposite happened. Yeah. Tough call. Tough call. So basically what happens is he's the champ, and he has to vacate the title. His final match really was kind of just uh, January 10th. He defended it against uh, Kevin Nash. Uh, ended in a no contest. He later would vacate the title, and of course, it sold out. The title, which we've talked about in the past too, was Brett. Uh, excuse me, uh, Sid versus Benoit, and so on and so forth. As far as that's concerned, but as far as Brett, he would make a few appearances for WCW in in 2000. Just later on, just you know, random appearances on Nitro, and he was on the, uh, the uh, New Blood Rising pay per view. Just few appearances, but his contract gets terminated October 20th due to the ongoing incapacity to wrestle and his retirement from wrestling, which technically happened six days later. So a real terrible end to his run in yeah. WCW there. Post-concussion syndrome did it, but basically they had to terminate the contract. It wasn't able to fill it. wasn't able to wrestle. Wow. 
what turned out to what looked like a very promising thing didn't turn out well for anybody. I know Chris Jericho has been pretty um, you know, vocal about it. He said there was so much backstage politics was going on, so much other stuff. Uh, bad luck was involved. You know, defending Brett, of course, but obviously most of that is, is 100% accurate, though, right? Yeah, I would think. I would and, think. And Brett himself was basically saying the steel plate where Goldberg speared him and they did the thing in Canada, that was a high point. The match against Benoit, the few matches against Benoit were his high points, and that's it. It's insane to think about that with Brett. Like, wait, that's it? Three high points? <laughs> that's it? But it kind of really was. It was such a letdown. Wow. Well, it could have been, right? He was proud to be WWE champion, but it was you know, obviously very short-lived and got cut short. What did you think just overall like, what, of his time there? I mean, were you disappointed at all? You couldn't put your finger on how he was misused, but you knew it. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, he, he, he he's a big star. He could have been a huge thing there. So basically from December 15th to basically October 20th, 2000. So 15, December 15th, 97 to October 20th, 2000. That was him and WCW won the tag title, was two-time world champion, four-time U.S. champion. But really, it was um, not what we expected as a fans. And like you said, not even what you expected from being one of the bookers. Right. What do you think of him overall? Counting, obviously, the WWF run. One of the greatest of all time? I mean, Oh, is yeah. He... Without question. Without question. So what happened? Why what why could WCW not utilize that talent? It's beyond me. I mean, we've been talking about it for an hour, and I think I said might have been something he said to somebody, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, there's some people that take offense to what you're saying. No matter how you try to make it right, they don't accept it. If you could go back in time, I know you were saying you would have changed the booking of Starkid 97. Obviously, <laughs> it was terrible. So obviously, you know, you would have. Would you have made Brett champion sooner or, or was Sting the champion at that point? And, and you got kind of got to go with Sting because you had built up Sting for a year. He's got to be champ. Like, would have Brett be the champ eventually or would you just have him kind of feud with Hogan? No, you could have built that up. Or, so just like you built Sting and Hogan up for a year, you could have built Sting and Brett up for a year. Because there was, remember, there's Hogan involved now. There's three of them. And then there's the NWO. There could have been so many things you could have done. Man, oh, man. Bret Hart and WCW, what could have been? Damn, that could have been uh, something special. And they blew it. I know uh, maybe Hogan feels different. Or Bischoff seems like he feels differently. But they, I mean, they definitely, definitely blew it, especially for $2.5 million a year. Oof. Well. We'll never know. All right. Great stopping point there. Let's hit the plugs. You can follow us uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website tmptempire.com. Visit the Pro Wrestling Tea Store for Kevin and visit, uh, obviously, Kevin Sullivan's store on there. You can visit Kevin on uh, Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. Kevin, what else you got going on? I'll be in Miami this Saturday signing autographs. So come out and see WCW. No, no, WWC, and uh, come by and tell me that you've listened to me and John. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. See you right back here next week for a little Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. We'll see you next week, folks.